I'm Vanessa Tyler and welcome to What's Eating Harlem where we cover the most exciting community in the world. There is so much going on here in Harlem. Let's get started. I say no drugs. This is a food place. I sell chicken, not drugs. The history of Harlem and food, the subject of a new documentary. Everyone is now hungry for Harlem. One look and you know they must live in Harlem. It's a certain style. Check out who our Selena Hill is spotlighting in Harlem style. What does Mama Funk say? Mama Funk says whatever Nona Hendrix tells her to. Yes, the Nona Hendrix and her one woman art show puts Harlem through a transformation. All of that on this edition of What's Eating Harlem. Closed captioning supported by Chocolate Restaurant Lounge, 2223 Frederick Douglass Boulevard, Harlem. Everyone meets at the bar at Chocolate. Late night weekend dining too. Chocolate Restaurant Lounge. What's Eating Harlem, funded in part by Cove Lounge. Situated in the heart of Harlem, it embodies the spirit and vitality of its community, delivering a unique blend of cool sophistication and urban edge. Harlem is welcoming a new season, white truffle season. Urbani truffles, just 24 hours ago in Italy underground, and put on a plane exported worldwide, just landing in New York, now heading uptown. White truffle season is here, and Urbani Truffles is a proud supporter of What's Eating Harlem. Jammin' in Harlem's oldest live dive bar. Harris Blues, live music every night. Owner Mr. Alabama Sam Harglass will make sure you have a ball. Eat, drink, join the party. Harlem's own Paris Blues, 121st and Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard, 7th Avenue, Harlem, is a proud supporter of what's eating Harlem. The Groove at Ponte Bistro. Mixing live music with upscale French African cuisine. At the corner of 139th and Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard and at their other location in Gramercy Park at 218 Third Avenue. The food, the fun, it's a party at Ponte. Ponte Bistro, 139th and 7th Avenue, Uptown. Delighted to support What's Eating Harlem. There is a heartbeat in Harlem that's all its own. Feeding that beat is the food. Because when you look at the history of Harlem, you think about folks migrated here and they came here and the only thing they had with them were their recipes. Powerhouse Productions producer Sonia Armstead and her partner Rochelle Brown Johnson had to document Harlem's food past. And this night, they served us a heaping helping of history with their documentary titled Harlem On My Plate, a food history dating back to the beginning. Essentially, it's how we express ourselves. It's what we did to pass on our culture. I mean, a lot of the elements to American food uh, were smuggled into the country on slave ships under head rags and scarves and, and in their hair, seeds that planted um, and really kept uh, the culinary legacy going. This history is so significant, even the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture is involved with preserving this documentary of record. The Schomburg Center for 90 years has been the leading repository for the global black story, and Harlem is the world's black mecca. 
but there is no Harlem without black folks and there's no black folks without food. Harlem has such a rich history and I think what people had never done before was connect that history to food and they're completely intertwined. It is a history still being written now that Harlem is in this culinary renaissance. The food scene clearly on the front burner. But we can't forget that Sylvia was the one who brought it there. But before Sylvia, there was a woman named Pigfoot Mary who sold pig's feet out of a baby carriage and made a lot of money doing that. And she retired a very wealthy woman. My grandmother was so much bigger than her dreams. We're an institution, but we're also still relevant. It's like we're riding this wave and we're, we're so happy to just be um, involved in this second renaissance, so to speak, and I have to put that in air quotes seriously. But to still be relevant amongst everything that's happening just really goes to show how important Sylvia's is. I've been going to Sylvia's since I was a kid. Celebrities, star chefs, all here to celebrate Harlem and its food. And yeah, you went downtown to eat, yeah, yeah. Now, now you, you, you go across, across the street to go eat. Clearly, Uptown is the place to be. People cannot afford the rest of New York, and they are moving to Harlem. They are discovering it. And sometimes things don't necessarily exist until certain people find it. So it's not that it wasn't there. It's just that the people who are finding it and taking it back to everyone else, now they're like, oh, look at this new thing. It is now the new thing with outdoor cafes and exciting nightlife. <laughs> I look at Harlem, I look at what's going on there and what's been going on the last couple of years. It's very vibrant, it's really, really happening. This documentary shows the legends of Harlem's cooking past. I said, no drugs, this is a food place. I sell chicken, not drugs. To Harlem's cooking present, including the creation of a new group of its own celebrity chefs. I'm building my legacy in Harlem and I and to be honest I don't think I would want to build my legacy anywhere else like I cooked in the West Village I cooked in Tribeca it didn't mean anything I cook helped cook great food but like cooking in Harlem every day waking up walking to work with the staff it like means more than just food it's like really part of this movement a movement changing the lives of the people who live in Harlem that's what I try to do with Street Bird and Red Rooster we have about 200 employees in Harlem, and that matters to me, um, and it matters to those families. And it's not only a place of employment, but it's a place that you can learn the trade, and to do it in Harlem, that's very meaningful. The producers are taking the documentary, Harlem on My Plate, around the country, giving everyone a taste of Harlem. What's Eating Harlem wants to get you involved? You got a story idea? Tell us. Go to our website, whatseatingharlem.com. There you can become a member and sign up to get discounts to some of the places we feature. Remember to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Harlem style. Today you'll meet the Gurney Sally, better known as the style god herself. She's the head wardrobe stylist in charge of keeping the cast of VH1's Black Ink crew fresh and fly. Plus, she's worked with celebrities like Amber Rose, Elvana, and Dawn Richards. And as you'll see, she has her own sporty chic style that makes her unique. Today we're here at the Setapani restaurant in Harlem and I'll speak to her about Harlem style. Pretty much the name Style God, it, it came about like a really funny way. So I think it was like when we pretty much we had just started filming Black Ink season one 
And it was like one of the first major events that like myself and like the rest of the crew, like we all got invited to. So it was a G-Shock event. This is like when ASAP Ferg just came out, when he was just coming out with the first single like work. So we were all excited to go. And I met this um, guy there and he pretty much like, I met him from doing like photography and like different spots in Harlem. And he just came up to me and he was like, you're Sigourney, you're the girl who pretty much styles like Puma and Sassy. He's like, oh, cause you be having like Sassy looking like sugar honey iced tea. You a style god. And after he said it, like I couldn't get it out my head. All right, one over here. All right. I got it, yeah, Okay. I got it. Okay, so all of you guys, that you see the guys that have their pieces, I'm gonna give them their pieces just to make sure that they're all together. I didn't even think I would ever be a stylist. I came into the industry like working with Trace Magazine and doing more event planning. I went to FIT for advertising and marketing. But when I look at it now, everything that I've done kind of helped me get to the point where I am now because I have the business savvy and also like the creative. And I feel like to be successful in anything in the entertainment industry, you have to have that balance with both. So how did you get into styling and in fashion? How did that even come about if you went to FIT um, for the business side? Um, from working with the magazine from Trace, it was very uh, independent magazine. Like at the time when I was working there, it was pretty much kind of like Trace magazine and Fader. They were going like head to head. So they were both kind of sort of like what we, what they call like that kind of market, like transculturalism where it pretty much is the ideal of we're all the same, no matter what color we are. And we all have different things that tie us and part of like culture. So the magazine would just be like an art issue and it would be artists from America, artists from Japan, artists from this, just showcasing that it was like everywhere. So that's why Fader and us would like go head to head. But I used to work with, um, I used to work underneath the fashion director Christine De La Sousse. She does a lot of things now for like Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, but there was one time she needed help on a photo shoot with Santi Gold. And that's like when she first was like coming out. And I think from that moment, like just seeing how it can go from being on a creative board, then getting into the actual like segment where I'm styling and I'm seeing this and I'm seeing the actual photos, seeing that whole process. I was just like amazed. You can do all of this, like this is a career. I never thought that it was like something because my mother's a teacher and my father's a correction officer. So I only was, I was supposed to be a lawyer. I was supposed to be a doctor. I was supposed to be a nurse. I was supposed to either do one of their careers. So the fact that like, even they're saying like, you can do something creative and like still actually using what you went to school for, like it boggles their mind. My whole ideal like styling, I don't really change the person. I feel like changing the person is not gonna be beneficial for me. And it's not gonna be beneficial for them. I feel like the best stylists are stylists who elevate their client. When you dress a certain way, you feel a certain way. That was my thing with Sassy. It's like she's always had a unique style. She's always been very stylish. Like even from the times I met her before I started becoming her stylist, so it was more about editing, taking out what she didn't need anymore, taking out what was completely outdated, keeping beneficial items in her closet, which are your basic everyday, your favorite pair of black jeans, no matter what. Even if they rip, you're gonna go and buy those same brand because you already know what the fit is, you know how it is that you like. And, you know, taking that and making her like, you know, the style icon that she has become. I've had almost every hair color. So I haven't done green, so I was like, let me try that. And it kind of like worked for me. I kind of never want to change my hair color. This, I actually found a necessary clothing. Like sometimes I, they have some good accessories. This necklace I got from um, one of the, the accessory designers that I do a lot of like pulling for for photo shoots, um, Madison Avenue Accessories um, from Ohio. So 
I love to support like up and coming like brands. I found this at American Apparel today. Um, I didn't even know American Apparel had jerseys. So I have like pretty much a checkered um, pencil skirt that I got from American Apparel also. Um, I guess to add in a little bit of femininity with that. And I have like one of my favorite like Reebok sneakers. I have a little bit like kind of what I call like sporty chic. Like I'll do the skirts, but then it'll probably be something like what I have on, like a jersey and like a pair of sneakers. I like to be comfortable, but also at the same time fashionable. So if it's unique and it's fabulous, then it must be Harlem style. I'm Selena Hill. It is opening night for Nona Hendricks. Normally, that means she's taking the stage. But on this night, her opening performance is on the walls of the Soul Studio Art Gallery in Harlem. I'm constantly transforming myself from one way that people know me, the public know me, into another, or evolving, or there's another word called alternations, being able to alternate between different worlds and, and bring elements of each world with you. So it is appropriate her show is titled Transformation because Ms. Hendricks is a woman who is constantly moving, evolving, transforming. Also creating a visual art, which is a transformation from the musical world that people know me and I integrate music into the visual art so that it's yet another transformation of the music that I made with uh, Patty and Sarah with LaBelle through to my solo music, and I'm transforming it into a visual representation. What a presentation it is. The pieces are loud with a message and a voice. She calls this Mama Funk. The unusual piece speaks with a clap. Mama Funk is, that, that's a kind of a, a lighter side of me. Mama Funk is, you know, this black woman or a woman who basically says, you know, whatever she needs to say. Like Mama Funk says, obey the funk. And that's really her whole thing is that, and the funk is really, you know, funk is non-descriptive in a way, because funk can be funky. A funk can be funky, a funk can be many things. Her art is light, whimsical, her art is heavy, serious, a commentary on the world. This towering interactive piece comes with its own video. That is my representation of, you know, it starts with the feather, with the Native, representing Native Americans, who are the indigenous people, who had an open arm, which is the open door, to help the pilgrims survive in America, to the Constitution, which is in the video that's there, and then the Statue of Liberty. And I noticed the Statue of Liberty is black. Yes. There are pieces created in tribute to amazing black women, like Venus Williams, and pieces like this one she calls The Death of Vinyl, in honor of the transformation of the music business, far different than her decades on stage, part of the legendary LaBelle. They were amazing. I mean, we were together for 17 years, uh, grew up basically together from 16, I think Patty and I were 16. Patty was six months older than me, I think, or something. So she was 17 already, going on 18. 
and Sarah was uh, just turned 16. So we grew up together like sisters and had so many adventures and traveled the world. At 71, Nona Hendrix still performs. Her music, political. She even has a song about the tea party. You may not know this about Nona. Nona is a nerd, really very tech savvy. All this interactive stuff in her show, these gadgets, she created herself. When I started to work with her, I realized that, wow, this person really understands that she wants to push it to a new level. She wants to actively decide to make the message interconnected, not just with herself and music anymore, but now with pieces of technology and experience that you can only understand by being there. Her show takes you in so many different directions, from fun fantasy to way too real. You're transformed just by browsing through. For me, it, it's just an amazing opportunity. Uh, Nona is an incredible performer, uh, but she's an even greater mind. She's an expansive thinker, she's an open person, and she's also a techie, which I think is just an incredible blend for someone that has had such a storied career as she has. I keep doing it and finding other ways to experiment with creativity specifically, whether it's uh, from writing songs, producing my own music, producing others, writing music for theater, writing music for dance, writing a musical, uh, writing music for film, and, and, doing, and now becoming much more of a visual artist and getting involved in technology. That's all the time we have for now. Join us next time on What's Eating Harlem. I'm Vanessa Tyler. See you uptown. Closed captioning supported by Chocolat Restaurant Lounge, 2223 Frederick Douglass Boulevard, Harlem. Everyone eats at the bar at Chocolat. Late night weekend dining too. Chocolat Restaurant Lounge. What's Eating Harlem funded in part by Cove Lounge, situated in the heart of Harlem, it embodies the spirit and vitality of its community, delivering a unique blend of cool sophistication and urban edge. Harlem is welcoming a new season, white truffle season. Urbani truffles, just 24 hours ago in Italy underground, and put on a plane exported worldwide, just landing in New York, now heading uptown. White truffle season is here. And our Bonnie Truffles is a proud supporter of What's Eating Harlem. Jammin' in Harlem's oldest live dive bar. Harris Blues, live music every night. Owner Mr. Alabama Sam Harglass will make sure you have a ball. Eat, drink, join the party. Harlem's own Harris Blues, 121st and Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard, 7th Avenue, Harlem, is a proud supporter of What's Eating Heart. The Groove at Ponte Bistro. Mixing live music with upscale French African cuisine. At the corner of 139th and Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard and at their other location in Gramercy Park at 218 3rd Avenue. The food, the fun, it's a party at Ponte. Ponte Bistro, 139th and 7th Avenue, Uptown. Delighted to support What's Eating Harlem. To become a member of What's Eating Harlem, go to www.whatseatingharlem.com and sign up for special events like wine tastings and food tastings. Also, join us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. If you have any ideas for stories about Harlem, send them to info at whatseatingharlem.com.